like to welcome the first very relevant topic panel, which is connecting the dots, why women's empowerment is relevant to every single person on the planet. So please help me welcome two extraordinary women, and I believe hopefully third is here as well. Um, the first is fashion designer, the fabulous fashion designer, Norma Kamali. Norma! That's fine. Actually, you know what? I think the moderator's gonna sit there, so we oh. want to sit at the end. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> um, the second speaker is award-winning journalist and author Marion Pearl. And the third is actress and women's advocate, Kelly Rutherford. Hi. And Asha Curran will be moderating this panel, who you've already met. Asha. Thanks, Claudia. <laughs> Thank you. Hi again, everybody. Uh, wow, I'm, I am thrilled to see you all once again and to be up here with uh, a really amazing and very eclectic group of women um, <laughs> to talk about, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not necessarily intuitive, but it's, it's great. Um, talk about investing in, in girls and women and to talk about the journeys that led these women to care so passionately about this subject and what they're doing to manifest that passion in both their personal and professional lives. Um, I, I'm so eager to talk to all of you that I, I'm not even sure who to start with, but I'm gonna start with the middle. So I'm gonna start with you, Marianne. Um, you've had an extraordinary journey and I'm curious why it led you to be this invested in this particular topic. And, um, and in particular, I'm, I'm really curious to hear you talk about your focus on storytelling, because I think that's something that is not necessarily mentioned enough when it comes to women's and girls' topics. So, uh, good uh, morning, I'm just right. <laughs> good morning. Um, so, the, my, my interest in women's issues actually started uh, about 10, 12 years ago, because it wasn't something that just came, no? But I did a book uh, which uh, had like 22 stories of women all over the world in 22 different countries. And when I saw what's, what's happening on the ground and what women are undertaking, I said, I felt like, in, if I'm gonna do journalism today, I wanna do it for something that's worth it. And women brought me that, because I am absolutely convinced that every effort I make will have a result. And that's kind of the only place in journalism that I can claim this, no? Uh, and the storytelling, I think it's a very, very important point. And I think, because what I feel is that, you know, when you look at history, how do you control the people? You, by owning the narrative, right? If you, the one who's gonna tell what history is, then you have the control. So really having the voice is having the narrative and the possibility of um, understanding the world another way, right? So recapturing that voice is very, very essential for women and I think we, we've only gotten there now after all the efforts that, we, you know, that we're doing. So, uh, the, for me, I, uh, so I take care of this platform for women's uh, issues, and I really try to do as many uh, first-person stories as possible, and they are incredible. No, so I think what I wanted to tell you is that for the you know the stories that we hear about in the news, like this horrible rape there, and you know if we look at the other um, one one story that tells you about a rape, tells, also tells you that. For that one rape I heard about, you know, how many more rapes are there, right. no? But I think that when you see a woman changing things around her for thousands and thousands of people, which is repeatedly happening, if you look at it, then it's also the same. It's like for one person that has that kind of courage, how many more are there, you know? And the storytelling allows that to emerge. And when that emerges, we are all set because it's very, very, very powerful women. It's also sort of reclaiming some lost history, right? Because yeah. the women's narrative is missing they have to. so much yeah. of the, the history that we They learned. have to, because now, like, you know, I, I just I'll give you an example of this little girl I talked to yesterday. She's 12 years old, and, um, and she doesn't want to go through um, female genital mutilation. So she's escaped. She's escaped, and she's the first, this is the first time in her village in, for, uh, in, since ever 
that uh, person has refused to be mutilated. So when that happens, you know, and, I, and particularly I want to say that, you know, these examples that are, that are really are fueling me are examples of women standing alone, you know, because a lot of people are doing things that they don't have networks like us, they don't have money, they don't have technology, they just have justice. Like they have a very, very powerful sense of justice. So when someone, you know, like grows on that ground, you can trust that person. You know, you don't have to be afraid that, you know, that other vested interests or anything is going to go into, you know, into her action. Her action is going to be fueled by justice. And justice doesn't mean revenge for women. Justice means justice. Sure. That's it. <laughs> and also with increasing technology, yeah. she also has access to other women's stories. Of course. Right. So the networking is very important. Validated. Yeah. Yeah. The storytelling thing also seems really relevant for you and what you do. I, I've been thinking about you lately because I, I have a 13-year-old daughter who's currently a, completely obsessed with Gossip Girl. Right, right. And, um, and, and therefore Now that you. storytelling, I don't know. Well, <laughs> well but, no, but it's really interesting, right? Because if I, I, I can blather on to her about feminism and whatnot and she kind of doesn't usually hear me. Yeah. She's 13. She hears you. Yes, she does. And so when she talks, she says to me, Mom, that mom married like seven different guys. Over She's the cool. Course of the, and I'm, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm like, but do you know that in real life, She's actually a huge advocate for women and for children. Yes. Right? And right. so that's powerful. She just happens to love men, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. Loving men is a huge part of it, right? Exactly. Engaging men is a huge part of well, it. You too. know, my mother, when I was young, all she talked about was Gloria Steinem and Ayn Rand and women's independence and how sh they all fought for us and this and that. And I was like, oh, mom, it's been done. Like, you guys all did such a great job. And so on and We're so there. forth. I was like, what are you talking? Yeah, that's great. Burn your bra, that was so unsexy, but whatever. And then, you know, life happens to you. you. You go along thinking that there's no sexism, that there's no violence against women, that rape just happens rarely. And it's because it's really not, in terms of storytelling, it's not really covered in the media enough for us to sort of go, in the numbers, the facts. I mean, 140,000 women have been victims of genital mutilation. So you have to imagine it's more than died in the Second World War. So we're this double, I think. <laughs> and this has been something that's been going on. The fact that it even exists is beyond our comprehension. And I think we see a huge uprising now of, you know, between the girls that were abducted, you know, the, the was it 200? Bring back, bring back yeah, the bring back the girls, or what's happening in India, and what I've been through in the family court system. And you, you realize, oh my God, be, they, because of the media, because of technology, we're starting to see it, and, and women are coming out of the woodwork and realizing that we have to, through whatever channels we have, get out there and start talking about it. If you have any resources at all, whether it's storytelling, the media, through fashion, through um, education, through community, and we all have to team together, because it's, it's now at such an extreme level. You have the Malala, you have, you know, you have it, it's coming out in such a huge way, and that's why we're all here today, because we have to. We have to now do something about it. It's beyond feminism. And why, talk about your current project with children. What led you there? Well, I just started the Children's Justice Campaign, and it's, it's I've never started an organization, so it's a very humbling <laughs> experience. Um, but it's, it's really about raising awareness in the media about the injustices happening to children in the family court system. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of, of sexual abuse, domestic violence that's happening. You know, mothers are being bankrupted. Mothers have nowhere to go with their children. They have no shelter. They have nothing. They have to literally drive their cars into the ocean because they have nowhere to go. It was on Pierce Morgan, and he was saying, you know, this, this woman, we, we've got to talk about mental illness. I said, this isn't mental illness. This is nowhere to go. This is you can't go to the family court system for help anymore. Yeah, yeah or they take your kids away. 58,000 children a year are given back to the abuser when the mother goes in and says, my children are being abused, I'm being abused, and they, say, they call it parental alienation. And the father's rights movement has become so strong that you know it's all about that. So it's, 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 it's been a very, again, I go, mom, you were right. <laughs> <laughs> you were right. We all you know. say that a lot. Exactly. You have to come back and have that moment right. with your mother. Yeah. It's usually after you give birth to your first child. Yes. <laughs> and then when they become a teenager. Exactly. Yeah. You get it all back. Again. <laughs> yeah. So Norma, 
Let's turn to you. So you've been an innovator in the fashion industry for a really long time, and um, and what was the sort of tipping point for you? When did this become such a such an area of passion for you, and why? Well, I was burning my bra, so I'm <laughs> part of that. And your group. boobs look great. <laughs> today. Really right. and, uh, she was fine. <laughs> so. So I, I've been connected to this for a while in, in a lot of ways. And um, I have to say, I, I started in business in 1967. So, and I've always been doing clothes for women. And I realized along the way in my own personal evolution through that period of time that um, having my own business was something I never thought would happen because I always thought, a man would know how to run the business. Mm -hmm. I was part of this old, you know, mm -hmm. it was different then, ladies. And, and um, then one day, with a whole bunch of circumstances that weren't good, I, I was in business with my ex-husband, and I finally said, I have $98 in the bank but I'm not staying here and I'll figure out a way to do this. And I don't know how I figured it out. <laughs> so thank you, but I, I, I was desperate and I was in a, a, a very difficult marriage and um, not any worse than maybe some of you here. And I thought, I have to leave my personal identity, my work, the, the, the career I was starting to create behind. If I have to, I can create it again. And fortunately, I did. And, and I realized I can run a business. I haven't had a partner since then. I don't know any money. It's a miracle. I don't know how it's <laughs> happening. But I realized that you don't have to have that certain type of personality or be the man to do it. And actually, I probably freed him up by not having that expectation of him. So then in my business, I and I got a lot of letters from women thanking me for my new logo, which was on my own, Norma Kamali. I couldn't use Kamali on its own. So I got letters saying, if you can do it, I can do it. And it was, the, the door had opened, and I maybe was one of the first through. Mm -hmm. and, and it helped a lot of women kind of feel they could move on. And so my personal experience kept going, and um, I would talk to a lot of women, and I interacted with a lot of women just in dressing room situations and talking, and I realized how impactful self-image is on women's performance or the ability or inability to reach their potential. And it really was so personal too because if I feel like I look good, get out of my way. I own, the, I own it. I own the day. I own everything, <laughs> right? But, but if I feel a little like my clothes are too tight or something's not right. I'm, I'm screwed up. I'm like, my head's all messed up. Like, well, why is that happening? It's the sickest thing. And I would see that I wasn't the only one. I would see it in play out with celebrities, famous people who have accomplished m amazing things, women who were just so awesome, even to today, can be taken down in a second just from some image issue. And it's been driving me crazy all these years. Well, how do I change it? What do I do? How can I help this? I'm observing it, trying to figure it out for myself. I started uh, to look at clothes that could help women feel better. But when you take off your clothes and you're standing looking in the mirror and you think, I don't feel so good. And, and Spanx aren't gonna make, sorry Spanx, but they're not gonna <laughs> make you feel better about yourself because you know that dirty little secret that when they come off, it's not gonna be pretty. So, uh, so then what do you eat? What do you do to exercise? So I've tried everything. and. And after the dancing your way through Studio 54, the 80s meant kind of 
work out, get yourself in shape. AIDS started, people started to think about health, fitness, so it was really important to, for me to understand that and share that. And then I thought wearing too much makeup makes people look old. How do you wear less makeup, feel good about your skin? That's another secret. The more we cover, the more secrets we have, and secrets bring you down. And then I thought it's all about not only fitness and health, but it's this internal thing. And it clicked for me, and it wasn't such a long time ago, but I, know I watched Bridesmaids with some friends, and, and I see early in the scene, there's John Hamm, and he's in bed with this willing participant who thinks she's going to turn him around, and he's going to be hers, right? Not. So I thought, oh, I've done that. I've done that maybe not with John Hamm, unfortunately, <laughs> but I've done that. I've thought I could kind of change the way he feels. So then I came back to work and I meet with women all the time. It's, you know, my company's all women. I have meetings with women. And I asked every, every time every meeting ended, I said, do you see bridesmaids? Yes. Did you see that? Have you ever done that? Unanimous. Unanimous. We've all objectified ourselves with the thought that we are going to change this guy and he's going to fall in love with us. So let me, let me introduce you. We're going to run out of time in 30 seconds. G give, give the audience a piece of advice okay. to, to so help us avoid back this. So to, back to storytelling. So storytelling is this. If you tell one of the worst, think of all of the most horrible situations where you've either been objectified, you've objectified yourself, but mostly those situations where you've been objectified, you're so humiliated and embarrassed, you could never talk about it. The secret that's wearing away at your self-esteem. I say, tell anybody. If it happens tomorrow or two minutes after you leave here, call a friend, tell people. It's like AA. Keep it out of your system because it's eroding your self-esteem to keep all those horrific stories. There are horrible stories all around the world, but in this room, I will tell you right now, because I've done these kinds of things and taped them and talked to women, we have stories that are so painful and so difficult to talk about. And the about. truth is, men will sleep with anything, so I don't know why we feel this way. <laughs> don't do that. But, but it's I mean, not, they always yeah. cheat with someone so much like more unattractive, or like some, you know, it's never yeah. like your beautiful friend, usually, well, sometimes, but not, but I mean, seriously. So why are we even worried? They but it's care. not just that, it's also <laughs> in the work, in the workplace, in, in, in lots of different situations. No, you have to get those stories out of you. Clean yourself, cleanse yourself of them, and by doing that, you'll encourage other women to tell their stories. When you have someone like this who can ask and, and get stories out of people who've had painful experiences, we can do it with each other because ours are different, and we, we have to do that. But isn't it about creating a new story for ourselves? Yes, exactly. Yeah. I, I think, think it's yeah, about pretty much it's, uh, you know, this, this idea of, uh, you know, uh, not so long ago, there was a rape in America, right? And the story was, uh, was told as, you know, what is this 13-year-old girl? Uh, why are you laughing? No, no. We're like, <laughs> we're, we're going, going over time. We're just going to keep talking. Back. Oh, okay. We're finish. Gonna, finish. I'll be back. One second. I, I could talk to you know, 13-year-old girl, why was she dressed like that? This is the New York Times. Yeah. Why is she dressed like that, you know? And at no point, you know, did they, did they talk about, so that's what I'm talking about in, in owning the narrative, you know, mm -hmm. because with owning the narrative comes the justice, with, uh, you know, and, with, and the self-esteem, mm -hmm. you know, because if we left to like, you know, base our self-esteem only on what we look like, that's also very poor, yeah. Yeah. isn't it? So just to finish, I want to tell people, because I know that, you know, I don't tell only horrible stories about, you know, uh, people are, elsewhere, I also talk a lot about what's going on in America, and I can tell you that something is that, you know, we're talking here to give to women, no, and be involved, as you said, right? But I think you can take a lot from them, mm -hmm. you know? And they have a lot of strength that we are not tapping. And one of them is that they, you know, a lot of, most women in the world love curves. 
they love buttons and they love bosoms and they love, you know, that's who they are. And all of a sudden, you know, changing the narrative mm -hmm. is also saying, hey, wait a second, you know, what are all the different perspectives? Women can bring you that, mm -hmm. which is why, you know, I insist on the first basis, you know, storytelling, because it doesn't matter if mm -hmm. she's sitting in, you know, in uh, Addis Abeba, she, you can, you can mm -hmm. relate. Women can relate, yeah. so. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you do. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. I could, I could talk forever.